Chapter 19 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition Volume 2 By Edgar Allan Poe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison William Wilson What say of it? What say of conscience grim? That spectre in my path? Chamberlain's Barrow Nieder. Let me call myself for the present William Wilson. The fair page now lying before me need not be solid with my real appellation. This has been already too much an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race. To the uttermost regions of the globe have not the indignant winds bruited its unparalleled infamy o oh, outcasts of all outcasts most abandoned to the earth art thou not for ever dead to its honours to its flowers to its golden aspirations and a cloud dense dismal and limitless does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven I would not, if I could, here or to-day, embody a record of my later years of unspeakable misery and unpardonable crime. This epoch, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation in turpitude, whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. From me in an instant all virtue dropped bodily as a mantle. From comparatively trivial wickedness I passed with the stride of a giant into more than the enormities of an Ela Gabalus. What chance, what one event brought this evil thing to pass bear with me while I relate? Death approaches and the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long, in passing through the dim valley, for the sympathy, I had nearly said for the pity, of my fellow men. I would fain have them believe that I have been in some measure the slave of circumstances beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I am about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow, what they cannot refrain from allowing, that, although temptation may have erewhile existed as great, man was never thus, at least, tempted before, certainly never thus fell and is it therefore that he has never thus suffered have i not indeed been living in a dream and am i not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildest of all sublunary visions i am the descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has at all times rendered them remarkable, and in my earliest infancy I gave evidence of having fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years, it was more strongly developed, becoming for many reasons a cause of serious disquietude to my friends, and of positive injury to myself. I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices, and a prey to the most ungovernable passions. Weak-minded, and beset with constitutional infirmities akin to my own, my parents could do but little to check the evil propensities which distinguished me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts 
resulted in complete failure on their part, and, of course, in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward my voice was a household law, and at an age when few children have abandoned their leading-strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will, and became, in all but name, the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large, rambling, Elizabethan house in a misty-looking village of England, where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees, and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment, in fancy, I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell, breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted Gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep. It gives me, perhaps, as much of pleasure as I can now in any manner experience to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns. Steeped in misery as I am, misery, alas, only too real, I shall be pardoned for seeking relief, however slight and temporary, in the weakness of a few rambling details. These, moreover, utterly trivial, and even ridiculous in themselves, assume to my fancy adventitious importance, as connected with a period and a locality when and where I recognize the first ambiguous monitions of the destiny which afterwards so fully overshadowed me. Let me then remember. The house, I have said, was old and irregular. The grounds were extensive, and a high and solid brick wall, topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass, encompassed the whole. This prison-like rampart formed the limit of our domain. Beyond it we saw but thrice a week. Once every Saturday afternoon, when, attended by two ushers, we were permitted to take brief walks in a body through some of the neighbouring fields, and twice during Sunday, when we were paraded in the same formal manner to the morning and evening service in the one church of the village. Of this church, the principal of our school was pastor, with how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was I wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery, as, with step solemn and slow, he ascended the pulpit. This reverend man, with countenance so demurely benign, with robes so glossy and so clerically flowing, with wig so minutely powdered, so rigid, and so vast. Could this be he who, of late, with sour visage and in snuffy habiliments, administered, ferule in hand, the draconian laws of the academy? Oh, gigantic paradox, too utterly monstrous for solution! At an angle of the ponderous wall, frowned a more ponderous gate. It was riveted and studded with iron bolts, and surmounted with jagged iron spikes. What impressions of deep awe did it inspire? It was never opened, save for the three periodical egressions and ingressions already mentioned, then 
in every creak of its mighty hinges we found a plenitude of mystery a world of matter for solemn remark or for more solemn meditation the extensive enclosure was irregular in form having many capacious recesses of these three or four of the largest constituted the playground it was level and covered with fine hard gravel i well remember it had no trees nor benches nor anything similar within it of course it was in the rear of the house in front lay a small parterre planted with box and other shrubs but through this sacred division we passed only upon rare occasions indeed such as a first advent to school or final departure thence or perhaps when a parent or friend having called for us we joyfully took our way home for the christmas or midsummer holidays but the house how quaint an old building was this to me how veritably a palace of enchantment there was really no end to its windings to its incomprehensible subdivisions it was difficult at any given time to say with certainty upon which of its two stories one happened to be from each room to every other there were sure to be found three or four steps either in ascent or descent then the lateral branches were innumerable inconceivable and so returning in upon themselves that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far different from those with which we pondered upon infinity during the five years of my residence here i was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality lay the little sleeping apartment designed to myself and some eighteen or twenty other scholars the schoolroom was the largest in the house i could not help thinking in the world it was very long narrow and dismally low with pointed gothic windows and a ceiling of oak in a remote and terror-inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight or ten feet comprising the sanctum during hours of our principal the reverend dr bransby it was a solid structure with massy door sooner than open which in the absence of the dominic we would all have willingly perished by the pan forte et dure in other angles were two other similar boxes far less reverenced indeed but still greatly matters of awe one of these was the pulpit of the classical usher one of the english and mathematical interspersed about the room crossing and recrossing in endless irregularity were innumerable benches and desks black ancient and time-worn piled desperately with much bethumbed books and so beseamed with initial letters names at full length grotesque figures and other multiplied efforts of the knife as to have entirely lost what little of original form might have been their portion in days long departed a huge bucket with water stood at one extremity of the room and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other encompassed by the massy walls of this venerable academy i passed yet not in tedium or disgust the years of the third lustrum of my life the teeming brain of childhood requires no external world of incident to occupy or amuse it and the apparently dismal monotony of a school was replete with more intense excitement than my riper youth has derived from luxury or my full manhood from crime yet i must believe that my first mental development had in it much of the uncommon even much of the outre 
upon mankind at large the events of very early existence rarely leave in mature age any definite impression all is grey shadow a weak and irregular remembrance an indistinct regathering of feeble pleasures and phantasmagoric pains with me this is not so in childhood i must have felt with the energy of a man what i now find stamped upon memory in lines as vivid as deep and as durable as the exergues of the carthaginian medals yet in fact in the fact of the world's view how little was there to remember the morning's awakening the nightly summons to bed the connings the recitations the periodical half-holidays and perambulations the playground with its broils its pastimes its intrigues these by a mental sorcery long forgotten were made to involve a wilderness of sensation a world of rich incident an universe of varied emotion of excitement the most passionate and spirit-stirring oh le bon temps que ce siècle de fer in truth the ardour the enthusiasm and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates and by slow but natural gradations gave me an ascendancy over all not greatly older than myself over all with a single exception this exception was found in the person of a scholar who although no relation bore the same christian and surname as myself a circumstance in fact little remarkable for notwithstanding a noble descent mine was one of those everyday appellations which seem by prescriptive right to have been time out of mind the common property of the mob in this narrative i have therefore designated myself as william wilson a fictitious title not very dissimilar to the real my namesake alone of those who in school phraseology constituted our set presumed to compete with me in the studies of the class in the sports and broils of the playground to refuse implicit belief in my assertions and submission to my will indeed to interfere with my arbitrary dictation in any respect whatsoever if there is on earth a supreme and unqualified despotism it is the despotism of a master mind in boyhood over the less energetic spirits of its companions wilson's rebellion was to me a source of the greatest embarrassment the more so as in spite of the bravado with which in public i made a point of treating him and his pretensions i secretly felt that i feared him and could not help thinking the equality which he maintained so easily with myself a proof of his true superiority since not to be overcome cost me a perpetual struggle yet this superiority even this equality was in truth acknowledged by no one but myself our associates by some unaccountable blindness seemed not even to suspect it indeed his competition his resistance and especially his impertinent and dogged interference with my purposes were not more pointed than private he appeared to be destitute alike of the ambition which urged and of the passionate energy of mind which enabled me to excel in his rivalry he might have been supposed actuated solely by a whimsical desire to thwart 
astonish or mortify myself, although there were times when I could not help observing, with a feeling made up of wonder, abasement and pique, that he mingled with his injuries, his insults, or his contradictions, a certain most inappropriate and assuredly most unwelcome affectionateness of manner. I could only conceive this singular behaviour to arise from a consummate self-conceit, assuming the vulgar airs of patronage and protection. Perhaps it was this latter trait in Wilson's conduct, conjoined with our identity of name, and the mere accident of our having entered the school upon the same day, which set afloat the notion that we were brothers among the senior classes in the academy. These do not usually inquire with much strictness into the affairs of their juniors. I have before said, or should have said, that Wilson was not, in the most remote degree, connected with my family. But assuredly, if we had been brothers, we must have been twins, for after leaving Dr. Bransby's, I casually learned that my namesake was born on the 19th of January, 1813. And this is a somewhat remarkable coincidence, for the day is precisely that of my own nativity. It may seem strange that, in spite of the continual anxiety occasioned me by the rivalry of Wilson and his intolerable spirit of contradiction, I could not bring myself to hate him altogether. We had, to be sure, nearly every day a quarrel in which, yielding me publicly the palm of victory, he, in some manner, contrived to make me feel that it was he who had deserved it. Yet a sense of pride on my part, and a veritable dignity on his own, kept us always upon what are called speaking terms, while there were many points of strong congeniality in our tempers, operating to awake me in a sentiment which our position alone, perhaps, prevented from ripening into friendship. It is difficult, indeed, to define, or even to describe, my real feelings towards him. They formed a motley and heterogeneous admixture. Some petulant animosity, which was not yet hatred, some esteem, more respect, much fear, with a world of uneasy curiosity. To the moralist it will be unnecessary to say, in addition, that Wilson and myself were the most inseparable of companions. It was, no doubt, the anomalous state of affairs existing between us which turned all my attacks upon him, and they were many, either open or covert, into the channel of banter or practical joke, giving pain while assuming the aspect of mere fun, rather than into a more serious and determined hostility. But my endeavours on this head were by no means uniformly successful, even when my plans were the most wittily concocted, for my namesake had much about him in character of that unassuming and quiet austerity which, while enjoying the poignancy of its own jokes, has no heel of Achilles in itself, and absolutely refuses to be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one vulnerable point, and that, lying in a personal peculiarity, arising, perhaps, from constitutional disease, would have been spared by any antagonist, less at his wit's end than myself. My rival had a weakness in the falcal or guttural organs, which precluded him from raising his voice at any time above a very low whisper. Of this defect I did not fail to take what poor advantage lay in my power, Wilson's retaliations in kind were many, and there was one form of his practical wit that disturbed me beyond measure. How his sagacity first discovered at all that so petty a thing would vex me, 
is a question I never could solve, but having discovered, he habitually practised the annoyance. I had always felt aversion to my uncourtly patronymic, and its very common, if not plebeian, pray no man. The words were venom in my ears, and when upon the day of my arrival a second William Wilson came also to the academy, I felt angry with him for bearing the name, and doubly disgusted with the name, because a stranger bore it, who would be the cause of its twofold repetition, who would be constantly in my presence, and whose concerns in the ordinary routine of the school business must inevitably, on account of the detestable coincidence, be often confounded with my own. The feeling of vexation thus engendered grew stronger with every circumstance tending to show resemblance, moral or physical, between my rival and myself. I had not then discovered the remarkable fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I perceived that we were even singularly alike in general contour of person and outline of feature. I was galled, too, by the rumour touching a relationship which had grown current in the upper forms. In a word, nothing could more seriously disturb me, although I scrupulously concealed such disturbance, than any allusion to a similarity of mind, person, or condition existing between us. But, in truth, I had no reason to believe that, with the exception of the matter of relationship, and in the case of Wilson himself, this similarity had ever been made a subject of comment, or even observed at all by our schoolfellows, that he observed it in all its bearings, and as fixedly as I was apparent, but that he could discover in such circumstances so fruitful a field of annoyance can only be attributed, as I said before, to his more than ordinary penetration his cue, which was to perfect an imitation of myself, lay both in words and in actions, and most admirably did he play his part. My dress, it was an easy matter to copy. My gait and general manner were, without difficulty, appropriated. In spite of his constitutional defect, even my voice did not escape him. My louder tones were of course unattempted, but then the key, it was identical, and his singular whisper, it grew the very echo of my own. How greatly this most exquisite portraiture harassed me, for it could not justly be termed a caricature, I will not now venture to describe. I have but one consolation, in the fact that the imitation apparently was noticed by myself alone, and that I had to endure only the knowing and strongly sarcastic smiles of my namesake himself. Satisfied with having produced in my bosom the intended effect, he seemed to chuckle in secret over the sting he had inflicted, and was characteristically disregardful of the public applause which the success of his witty endeavours might have so easily elicited that the school, indeed, did not feel his design, perceive its accomplishment, and participate in his sneer, was, for many anxious months, a riddle I could not resolve. Perhaps the gradation of his copy rendered it not so readily perceptible, or, more possibly, I owed my security to the master heir of the copyist, who, disdaining the letter, which in a painting is all the obtuse can see, gave but the full spirit of his original for my individual contemplation and chagrin. I have already more than once spoken of the disgusting air of patronage which he assumed toward me, and of his frequent officious interference with my will. This interference 
often took the ungracious character of advice advice not openly given but hinted or insinuated i received it with a repugnance which gained strength as i grew in years yet at this distant day let me do him the simple justice to acknowledge that i can recall no occasion when the suggestions of my rival were on the side of those errors or follies so usual to his immature age and seeming inexperience that his moral sense at least if not his general talents and worldly wisdom was far keener than my own and that i might to-day have been a better and thus a happier man had i less frequently rejected the counsels embodied in those meaning whispers which i then but too cordially hated and too bitterly despised as it was i at length grew restive in the extreme under his distasteful supervision and daily resented more and more openly what i considered his intolerable arrogance i have said that in the first years of our connection as schoolmates my feelings in regard to him might have been easily ripened into friendship but in the latter months of my residence at the academy although the intrusion of his ordinary manner had beyond doubt in some measure abated my sentiments in nearly similar proportion partook very much of positive hatred upon one occasion he saw this i think and afterwards avoided or made a show of avoiding me it was about the same period if i remember aright that in an altercation of violence with him in which he was more than usually thrown off his guard and spoke and acted with an openness of demeanour rather foreign to his nature i discovered or fancied i discovered in his accent his air and general appearance a something which first startled and then deeply interested me a something which first startled and then deeply interested me by bringing to mind dim visions of my earliest infancy wild confused and thronging memories of a time when memory herself was yet unborn i cannot better describe the sensation which oppressed me than by saying that i could with difficulty shake off the belief of my having been acquainted with the being who stood before me at some epoch very long ago some point of the past even infinitely remote the delusion however faded rapidly as it came and i mention it at all but to define the day of the last conversation i there held with my singular namesake the huge old house with its countless subdivisions had several large chambers communicating with each other where slept the greater number of the students there were however as must necessarily happen in a building so awkwardly planned many little nooks or recesses the odds and ends of the structure and these the economic ingenuity of dr bransby had also fitted up as dormitories although being the merest closets they were capable of accommodating but a single individual one of these small apartments was occupied by wilson one night about the close of my fifth year at the school and immediately after the altercation just mentioned finding every one wrapped in sleep i arose from bed and lamp in hand stole through a wilderness of narrow passages from my own bedroom to that of my rival i had long been plotting one of those ill-natured pieces of practical wit at his expense in which i had hitherto been so uniformly unsuccessful it was my intention now to put my scheme in operation and i resolved to make him feel the whole extent of the malice with which i was imbued having reached his closet i noiselessly entered leaving the lamp with a shade over it on the outside i advanced a step and listened to the sound of his tranquil breathing assured of his being asleep 
I returned, took the light, and with it again approached the bed. Close curtains were around it, which, in the prosecution of my plan, I slowly and quietly withdrew, when the bright rays fell vividly upon the sleeper, and my eyes at the same moment upon his countenance, I looked, and a numbness, an iciness of feeling, instantly pervaded my frame. My breast heaved, my knees tottered, my whole spirit became possessed with an objectless yet intolerable horror. Gasping for breath, I lowered the lamp in still nearer proximity to the face. Were these, these, the lineaments of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that they were his, but I shook as if with a fit of the ague in fancying they were not. What was there about them to confound me in this manner? I gazed while my brain reeled with a multitude of incoherent thoughts. Not thus he appeared, assuredly not thus, in the vivacity of his waking hours. The same name, the same contour of person, the same day of arrival at the academy, and then his dogged and meaningless imitation of my gait, my voice, my habits, and my manner. Was it, in truth, within the bounds of human possibility, that what I now saw was the result, merely, of the habitual practice of this sarcastic imitation. Awe-stricken, and with a creeping shudder, I extinguished the lamp, passed silently from the chamber, and left, at once, the halls of that old academy, never to enter them again. After a lapse of some months, spent at home in mere idleness, I found myself a student at Eton. The brief interval had been sufficient to enfeeble my remembrance of the events at Dr. Bransby's, or at least to effect a material change in the nature of the feelings with which I remembered them. The truth, the tragedy of the drama was no more. I could now find room to doubt the evidence of my senses, and seldom called up the subject at all, but with wonder at extent of human credulity, and a smile at the vivid force of the imagination which I hereditarily possessed. Neither was this species of scepticism likely to be diminished by the character of the life I led at Eton. The vortex of thoughtless folly, into which I there so immediately and so recklessly plunged, washed away all but the froth of my past hours, engulfed at once every solid or serious impression, and left to memory only the veriest levities of a former existence. I do not wish, however, to trace the course of my miserable profligacy here, a profligacy which set at defiance the laws, while it eluded the vigilance of the institution. Three years of folly, passed without profit, had but given me rooted habits of vice, and added, in a somewhat unusual degree, to my bodily stature, when, after a week of soulless dissipation, I invited a small party of the most dissolute students to a secret carousal in my chambers. We met at a late hour of the night, for our debaucheries were to be faithfully protracted until morning. The wine flowed freely, and there were not wanting other, and perhaps more dangerous seductions, so that the grey dawn had already faintly appeared in the east, while our delirious extravagance was at its height. Madly flushed with cards and intoxication, I was in the act of insisting upon a toast of more than wonted profanity, when my attention was suddenly diverted by the violent, although partial unclosing of the door of the apartment, and by the eager voice of a servant from without. He said that some person, apparently in great haste, demanded to speak with me in the hall. Wildly excited with wine, the unexpected interruption rather delighted than surprised me. I staggered forward at once, and a few steps brought me to the vestibule of the building. In this low and small room there hung no lamp, 
and now no light at all was admitted save that of the exceedingly feeble dawn which made its way through the semicircular window as i put my foot over the threshold i became aware of the figure of a youth about my own height and habited in a white kerseymere morning frock cut in the novel fashion of the one i myself wore at the moment this the faint light enabled me to perceive but the features of his face i could not distinguish upon my entering he strode hurriedly up to me and seizing me by the arm with a gesture of petulant impatience whispered the words william wilson in my ear i grew perfectly sober in an instant there was that in the manner of the stranger and in the tremulous shake of his uplifted finger as he held it between my eyes and the light which filled me with unqualified amazement but it was not this which had so violently moved me it was the pregnancy of solemn admonition in the singular low hissing utterance and above all it was the character the tone the key of those few simple and familiar yet whispered syllables which came with a thousand thronging memories of bygone days and struck upon my soul with the shock of a galvanic battery ere i could recover the use of my senses he was gone although this event failed not of a vivid effect upon my disordered imagination yet was it evanescent as vivid for some weeks indeed i busied myself in earnest inquiry or was wrapped in a cloud of morbid speculation i did not pretend to disguise from my perception the identity of the singular individual who thus perseveringly interfered with my affairs and harassed me with his insinuated counsel but who and what was this wilson and whence came he and what were his purposes upon neither of these points could i be satisfied merely ascertaining in regard to him that a sudden accident in his family had caused his removal from dr bransby's academy on the afternoon of the day in which i myself had eloped but in a brief period i ceased to think upon the subject my attention being all absorbed in a contemplated departure for oxford thither i soon went the uncalculating vanity of my parents furnishing me with an outfit and annual establishment which would enable me to indulge at will in the luxury already so dear to my heart to vie in profuseness of expenditure with the haughtiest heirs of the wealthiest earldoms in great britain excited by such appliances to vice my constitutional temperament broke forth with redoubled ardour and i spurned even the common restraints of decency in the mad infatuation of my revels but it were absurd to pause in the detail of my extravagance let it suffice that among spendthrift i outherited herod and that giving name to a multitude of novel follies i added no brief appendix to the long catalogue of vices then usual in the most dissolute university of europe it could hardly be credited however that i had even here so utterly fallen from the gentlemanly estate as to seek acquaintance with the vilest arts of the gambler by profession and having become an adept in his despicable science to practise it habitually as a means of increasing my already enormous income at the expense of the weak-minded among my fellow collegians such nevertheless was the fact and the very enormity of this offence against all manly and honourable sentiment proved beyond doubt the main if not the sole reason of the impunity with which it was committed who indeed among my most abandoned associates would not rather have disputed the clearest evidence of his senses than have suspected of such courses the gay the frank the generous william wilson the noblest and most liberal commoner at oxford 
him whose follies said his parasites were but the follies of youth and unbridled fancy whose errors but inimitable whim whose darkest vice but a careless and dashing extravagance i had been now two years successfully busied in this way when there came to the university a young parvenu nobleman glen ginning rich said report as herodes atticus his riches too as easily acquired i soon found him of weak intellect and of course marked him as a fitting subject for my skill i frequently engaged him in play and contrived with the gambler's usual art to let him win considerable sums the more effectually to entangle him in my snares at length my schemes being ripe i met him with the full intention that this meeting should be final and decisive at the chambers of a fellow commoner mr preston equally intimate with both but who to do him justice entertained not even a remote suspicion of my design to give to this a better colouring i had contrived to have assembled a party of some eight or ten and was solicitously careful that the introduction of cards should appear accidental and originate in the proposal of my contemplated dupe himself to be brief upon a vile topic none of the low finesse was omitted so customary upon similar occasions that it is a just matter for wonder how any are still found so besotted as to fall its victim we had protracted our sitting far into the night and i had at length effected the manoeuvre of getting glendinning as my sole antagonist the game too was my favourite ecarte the rest of the company interested in the extent of our play had abandoned their own cards and were standing around us as spectators the parvenu who had been induced by my artifices in the early part of the evening to drink deeply now shuffled dealt or played with a wild nervousness of manner for which his intoxication i thought might partially but could not altogether account in a very short period he had become my debtor to a large amount when having taken a long draught of port he did precisely what i had been coolly anticipating he proposed to double our already extravagant stakes with a well-feigned show of reluctance and not until after my repeated refusal had seduced him into some angry words which gave a colour of pique to my compliance did i finally comply the result of course did but prove how entirely the prey was in my toils in less than an hour he had quadrupled his debt for some time his countenance had been losing the florid tinge lent it by the wine but now to my astonishment i perceived that it had grown to a pallor truly fearful i say to my astonishment glendinning had been represented to my eager inquiries as immeasurably wealthy and the sums which he had as yet lost although in themselves vast could not i supposed very seriously annoy much less so violently affect him that he was overcome by the wine just swallowed was the idea which most readily presented itself and rather with a view to the preservation of my own character in the eyes of my associates than from any less interested motive i was about to insist peremptorily upon a discontinuance of the play when some expressions at my elbow from among the company and an ejaculation evincing utter despair on the part of glendinning gave me to understand that i had effected his total ruin under circumstances which rendering him an object for the pity of all should have protected him from the ill offices even of a fiend what now might have been my conduct it is difficult to say the pitiable condition of my dupe had thrown an air of embarrassed gloom over all and for some moments a profound silence was maintained during which i could not help feeling my cheeks tingle 
with the many burning glances of scorn or reproach cast upon me by the less abandoned of the party. I will even own that an intolerable weight of anxiety was for a brief instant lifted from my bosom by the sudden and extraordinary interruption which ensued. The wide, heavy, folding doors of the apartment were all at once thrown open to their full extent with a vigorous and rushing impetuosity that extinguished as if by magic every candle in the room. Their light in dying enabled us just to perceive that a stranger had entered about my own height and closely muffled in a cloak. The darkness, however, was now total, and we could only feel that he was standing in our midst. Before any one of us could recover from the extreme astonishment into which this rudeness had thrown all, we heard the voice of the intruder. Gentlemen, he said, in a low, distinct, and never-to-be-forgotten whisper, which thrilled to the very marrow of my bones. Gentlemen, I make no apology for this behaviour, because, in thus behaving, I am but fulfilling a duty. You are, beyond doubt, uninformed of the true character of the person who has tonight won at a cat a large sum of money from Lord Glendinning. I will therefore put you upon an expeditious and decisive plan of obtaining this very necessary information. Please to examine at your leisure the inner linings of the cup of his left sleeve and the several little packages which may be found in the somewhat capacious pockets of his embroidered morning wrapper. While he spoke, so profound was the stillness that one might have heard a pin drop upon the floor. In ceasing, he departed at once, and as abruptly as he had entered. Can I, shall I describe my sensations? Must I say that I felt all the horrors of the damned? Most assuredly, I had little time given for reflection. Many hands roughly seized me upon the spot, and lights were immediately reprocured. A search ensued. In the lining of my sleeve were found all the court cards essential in a cart, and in the pockets of my wrapper a number of packs, facsimiles of those used at our sittings, with the single exception that mine were of the species called technically arandes, the honours being slightly convex at the ends, the lower cards slightly convex at the sides. In this disposition, the dupe who cuts as customary at the length of the pack will invariably find that he cuts his antagonist an honour, while the gambler, cutting at the breadth, will, as certainly, cut nothing for his victim which may count in the records of the game. Any burst of indignation upon this discovery would have affected me less than the silent contempt or the sarcastic composure with which it was received. Mr. Wilson, said our host, stooping to remove from beneath his feet an exceedingly luxurious cloak of rare furs. Mr. Wilson, this is your property. The weather was cold, and upon quitting my own room, I had thrown a cloak over my dressing wrapper, putting it off upon reaching the scene of play. I presume it is supererogatory to seek here, eyeing the folds of the garment with a bitter smile, for any farther evidence of your skill. Indeed, we have had enough. You will see the necessity, I hope, of quitting Oxford, at all events, of quitting instantly my chambers. A base humble to the dust as I then was, it is probable that I should have resented this galling language by immediate personal violence, had not my whole attention been at the moment arrested by a fact of the most startling character. The cloak which I had worn was of a rare description of fur, how rare, how extravagantly costly, I shall not venture to say. Its fashion, too, was of my own fantastic invention, for I was fastidious to an absurd degree of coxcombery in matters of this frivolous nature. When, therefore, Mr. Preston reached me that which he had picked up upon the floor, 
and near the folding doors of the apartment it was with an astonishment nearly bordering upon terror that i perceived my own already hanging on my arm where i had no doubt unwittingly placed it and that the one presented me was but its exact counterpart in every in even the minutest possible particular the singular being who had so disastrously exposed me had been muffled i remembered in a cloak and none had been worn at all by any of the members of our party with the exception of myself retaining some presence of mind i took the one offered me by preston placed it unnoticed over my own left the apartment with a resolute scowl of defiance and next morning ere dawn of day commenced a hurried journey from oxford to the continent in a perfect agony of horror and of shame i fled in vain my evil destiny pursued me as if in exultation and proved indeed that the exercise of its mysterious dominion had as yet only begun scarcely had i set foot in paris ere i had fresh evidence of the detestable interest taken by this wilson in my concerns years flew while i experienced no relief villain at rome with how untimely yet with how spectral an officiousness stepped he in between me and my ambition at vienna too at Berlin, and at moscow where in truth had i not bitter cause to curse him within my heart from his inscrutable tyranny did i at length flee panic-stricken as from a pestilence and to the very ends of the earth i fled in vain and again and again in secret communion with my own spirit would i demand the questions who is he whence came he and what are his objects but no answer was there found and then i scrutinized with a minute scrutiny the forms and the methods and the leading traits of his impertinent supervision but even here there was very little upon which to base a conjecture it was noticeable indeed that in no one of the multiplied instances in which he had of late crossed my path had he so crossed it except to frustrate those schemes or to disturb those actions which if fully carried out might have resulted in bitter mischief poor justification this in truth for an authority so imperiously assumed poor indemnity for natural rights of self-agency so pertinaciously and so insultingly denied i had also been forced to notice that my tormentor for a very long period of time while scrupulously and with miraculous dexterity maintaining his whim of an identity of apparel with myself had so contrived it in the execution of his varied interference with my will that i saw not at any moment the features of his face be wilson what he might this at least was but the veriest of affectation or of folly could he for an instant have supposed that in my admonisher at eton in the destroyer of my honour at oxford in him who thwarted my ambition at rome my revenge at paris my passionate love at naples or what he falsely termed my avarice in egypt that in this my arch enemy and evil genius could fail to recognize the william wilson of my schoolboy days the namesake the companion the rival the hated and dreaded rival at dr bransby's impossible but let me hasten to the last eventful scene of the drama thus far i had succumbed supinely to this imperious domination the sentiment of deep awe with which i habitually regarded the elevated character the majestic wisdom the apparent omnipresence and omnipotence of wilson added to a feeling of even terror with which certain other traits in his nature and assumptions inspired me had operated hitherto to impress me with an idea of my own utter weakness and helplessness and to suggest an implicit although bitterly reluctant submission to his arbitrary will but of late days i had given myself up entirely to wine and its maddening influence upon my hereditary temper rendered me more and more impatient of control i began to murmur to hesitate to resist 
and was it only fancy which induced me to believe that with the increase of my own firmness that of my tormentor underwent a proportional diminution be this as it may i now began to feel the inspiration of a burning hope and at length nurtured in my secret thoughts a stern and desperate resolution that i would submit no longer to be enslaved it was at rome during the carnival of eighteen that i attended a masquerade in the palazzo of the neapolitan duke di broglio i had indulged more freely than usual in the excesses of the wine-table and now the suffocating atmosphere of the crowded rooms irritated me beyond endurance the difficulty too of forcing my way through the mazes of the company contributed not a little to the ruffling of my temper for i was anxiously seeking let me not say with what unworthy motive the young the gay the beautiful wife of the aged and doting de Broglio. with a too unscrupulous confidence she had previously communicated to me the secret of the costume in which she would be habited and now having caught a glimpse of her person i was hurrying to make my way into her presence at this moment i felt a light hand placed upon my shoulder and that ever remembered low damnable whisper within my ear in an absolute frenzy of wrath i turned at once upon him who had thus interrupted me and seized him violently by the collar he was attired as i had expected in a costume altogether similar to my own wearing a spanish cloak of blue velvet begirt about the waist with a crimson belt sustaining a rapier a mask of black silk entirely covered his face scoundrel i said in a voice husky with rage while every syllable i uttered seemed as new fuel to my fury scoundrel impostor accursed villain you shall not you shall not dog me unto death follow me or i stab you where you stand and i broke my way from the ballroom into a small antechamber adjoining dragging him unresistingly with me as i went upon entering i thrust him furiously from me he staggered against the wall while i closed the door with an oath and commanded him to draw he hesitated but for an instant then with a slight sigh drew in silence and put himself upon his defence the contest was brief indeed i was frantic with every species of wild excitement and felt within my single arm the energy and power of a multitude in a few seconds i forced him by sheer strength against the wainscoting and thus getting him at mercy plunged my sword with brute ferocity repeatedly through and through his bosom at that instant some person tried the latch of the door i hastened to prevent an intrusion and then immediately returned to my dying antagonist but what human language can adequately portray that astonishment that horror which possessed me at the spectacle then presented to view the brief moment in which i averted my eyes had been sufficient to produce apparently a material change in the arrangements at the upper or farther end of the room a large mirror so at first it seemed to me in my confusion now stood where none had been perceptible before and as i stepped up to it in extremity of terror mine own image but with features all pale and dabbled in blood advanced to meet me with a feeble and tottering gait thus it appeared i say but was not it was my antagonist it was wilson who then stood before me in the agonies of his dissolution his mask and cloak lay where he had thrown them upon the floor not a thread in all his raiment not a line in all the marked and singular lineaments of his face which was not even in the most absolute identity mine own it was wilson but he spoke no longer in a whisper and i could have fancied that i myself was speaking while he said you have conquered and i yield yet henceforward art thou also dead dead to the world to heaven and to hope in me didst thou exist and in my death see by this image which is thine own how utterly thou hast murdered thyself 
End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 2 By Edgar Allan Poe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison The Tell-Tale Heart True nervous very very dreadfully nervous i had been and am but why will you say that i am mad the disease had sharpened my senses not destroyed not dulled them above all was the sense of hearing acute i heard all things in the heaven and in the earth i heard many things in hell how then am i mad hearken and observe how healthily how calmly i can tell you the whole story it is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain but once conceived it haunted me day and night object there was none passion there was none i loved the old man he had never wronged me he had never given me insult for his gold i had no desire i think it was his eye yes it was this he have the eye of a vulture a pale blue eye with a film over it whenever it fell upon me my blood ran cold and so by degrees very gradually i made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye for ever now this is the point you fancy me mad madmen know nothing but you should have seen me you should have seen how wisely i proceeded with what caution with what foresight with what dissimulation i went to work i was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before i killed him and every night about midnight i turned the latch of his door and opened it oh so gently and then when i had made an opening sufficient for my head i put in a dark lantern all closed closed that no light shone out and then i thrust in my head oh you would have laughed to see how cunningly i thrust it in i moved it slowly very very slowly so that i might not disturb the old man's sleep it took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that i could see him as he lay upon his bed Ah would a madman have been so wise as this and then when my head was well in the room i undid the lantern cautiously oh so cautiously cautiously for the hinges creaked i undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye and this i did for seven long nights every night just at midnight but i found the eye always closed and so it was impossible to do the work for it was not the old man who vexed me but his evil eye and every morning when the day broke i went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him calling him by name in a hearty tone 
and inquiring how he has passed the night. So, you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close-fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door and I kept pushing it on, steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death-watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no, it was the low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp? Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and envelop the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern, so I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon his vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. 
but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbour. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer, when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. Ha <laughs> ha! When I had made an end of these labours, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbour during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. 
i led them at length to his chamber i showed them his treasures secure undisturbed in the enthusiasm of my confidence i brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while i myself in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim the officers were satisfied my manner had convinced them i was singularly at ease they sat and while i answered cheerily they chatted of familiar things but ere long i felt myself getting pale and wished them gone my head ached and i fancied a ringing in my ears but still they sat and still chatted the ringing became more distinct it continued and became more distinct i talked more freely to get rid of the feeling but it continued and gained definiteness until at length i found that the noise was not within my ears no doubt i now grew very pale but i talked more fluently and with a heightened voice yet the sound increased and what could i do it was a low dull quick sound much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton i gasped for breath and yet the officers heard it not i talked more quickly more vehemently but the noise steadily increased i arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations but the noise steadily increased why would they not be gone i paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men but the noise steadily increased oh god what could i do i foamed i raved i swore i swung the chair upon which i had been sitting and grated it upon the boards but the noise arose over all and continually increased it grew louder 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled was it possible they heard not almighty god no no they heard they suspected they knew they were making a mockery of my horror this i thought and this i think but anything was better than this agony anything was more tolerable than this derision i could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer i felt that i must scream or die and now again hark louder 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 villains i shrieked dissemble no more i admit the deed tear up the planks here here it is the beating of his hideous heart End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Berenice. Disque band miki sodales si sepulcrum amike visitarum curas meas eliquentulam fori levatas eben zayat misery is manifold the wretchedness of earth is multiform overreaching the wide horizon as the rainbow its hues are as various as the hues of that arch as distinct too yet as intimately blended overreaching the wide horizon as the rainbow how is it that from beauty i have derived a type of unloveliness from the covenant of peace a simile of sorrow but as in ethics evil is a consequence of good so in fact 
out of joy is sorrow born either the memory of past bliss is the anguish of today or the agonies which are have their origin in the ecstasies which might have been my baptismal name is egeus that of my family i will not mention yet there are no towers in the land more time-honoured than my gloomy grey hereditary halls our line has been called a race of visionaries and in many striking particulars in the character of the family mansion in the frescoes of the chief saloon in the tapestries of the dormitories in the chiselling of some buttresses in the armoury but more especially in the gallery of antique paintings in the fashion of the library chamber and lastly in the very peculiar nature of the library's contents there is more than sufficient evidence to warrant the belief the recollections of my earliest years are connected with that chamber and with its volumes of which latter i will say no more here died my mother herein was i born but it is mere idleness to say that i had not lived before that the soul had no previous existence you deny it let us not argue the matter convinced myself i seek not to convince there is however a remembrance of aerial forms of spiritual and meaning eyes of sounds musical yet sad a remembrance which will not be excluded a memory like a shadow vague variable indefinite unsteady and like a shadow too in the impossibility of my getting rid of it while the sunlight of my reason shall exist in that chamber was i born thus awaking from the long night of what seemed but was not non-entity at once into the very regions of fairyland into a palace of imagination into the wild dominions of monastic thought and erudition it is not singular that i gazed around me with a startled and ardent eye that i loitered away my boyhood in books and dissipated my youth in reverie but it is singular that as years rolled away and the noon of manhood found me still in the mansion of my fathers it is wonderful what stagnation there fell upon the springs of my life wonderful how total an inversion took place in the character of my commonest thought the realities of the world affected me as visions and as visions only while the wild ideas of the land of dreams became in turn not the material of my everyday existence but in very deed that existence utterly and solely in itself berenice and i were cousins and we grew up together in my paternal halls yet differently we grew i ill of health and buried in gloom she agile graceful and overflowing with energy hers the ramble on the hillside mine the studies of the cloister i living within my own heart and addicted body and soul to the most intense and painful meditation she roaming carelessly through life with no thought of the shadows in her path or the silent flight of the raven-winged hours berenice i call upon her name berenice and from the grey ruins of memory a thousand tumultuous recollections are startled at the sound how vividly 
is her image before me now as in the early days of her light-heartedness and joy oh gorgeous yet fantastic beauty oh self amid the shrubberies of arnheim oh naiad among its fountains and then then all is mystery and terror and a tale which should not be told disease a fatal disease fell like the simoon upon her frame and even while i gazed upon her the spirit of change swept over her pervading her mind her habits and her character and in a manner the most subtle and terrible disturbing even the identity of her person alas her destroyer came and went and the victim where is she i knew her not or knew her no longer as berenice among the numerous train of maladies superinduced by that fatal and primary one which affected a revolution of so horrible a kind in the moral and physical being of my cousin may be mentioned as the most distressing and obstinate in its nature a species of epilepsy not unfrequently terminating in trance itself trance very nearly resembling positive dissolution and from which her manner of recovery was in most instances startlingly abrupt in the meantime my own disease for i have been told that i should call it by no other appellation my own disease then grew rapidly upon me and assumed finally a monomanic character of a novel and extraordinary form hourly and momently gaining vigour and at length obtaining over me the most incomprehensible ascendancy this monomania if i must so term it consisted in a morbid irritability of those properties of the mind in metaphysical science termed the attentive it is more than probable that i am not understood but i fear indeed that it is in no manner possible to convey to the mind of the merely general reader an adequate idea of that nervous intensity of interest with which in my case the powers of meditation not to speak technically busied and buried themselves in the contemplation of even the most ordinary objects of the universe to muse for long unwearied hours with my attention riveted to some frivolous device on the margin or in the typography of a book to become absorbed for the better part of a summer's day in a quaint shadow falling aslant upon the tapestry or upon the floor to lose myself for an entire night in watching the steady flame of a lamp or the embers of a fire to dream away whole days over the perfume of a flower to repeat monotonously some common word until the sound by dint of frequent repetition ceased to convey any idea whatever to the mind to lose all sense of motion or physical existence by means of absolute bodily quiescence long and obstinately persevered in such were a few of the most common and least pernicious vagaries induced by a condition of the mental faculties not indeed altogether unparalleled but certainly bidding defiance to anything like analysis or explanation yet let me not be misapprehended the undue earnest and morbid attention thus excited by objects in their own nature frivolous must not be confounded in character 
with that ruminating propensity common to all mankind and more especially indulged in by persons of ardent imagination it was not even as might be at first supposed an extreme condition or exaggeration of such propensity but primarily and essentially distinct and different in the one instance the dreamer or enthusiast being interested by an object usually not frivolous imperceptibly loses sight of this object in a wilderness of deductions and suggestions issuing therefrom until at the conclusion of a daydream often replete with luxury he finds the incitamentum or first cause of his musings entirely vanished and forgotten in my case the primary object was invariably frivolous although assuming through the medium of my distempered vision a refracted and unreal importance few deductions if any were made and those few pertinaciously returning in upon the original object as a centre the meditations were never pleasurable and at the termination of the reverie the first cause so far from being out of sight had attained that supernaturally exaggerated interest which was the prevailing feature of the disease in a word the powers of mind more particularly exercised were with me as i have said before the attentive and art with the day-dreamer the speculative my books at this epoch if they did not actually serve to irritate the disorder partook it will be perceived largely in their imaginative and inconsequential nature of the characteristic qualities of the disorder itself i well remember among others the treatise of the noble italian quelius secundus curaio de amplitudine beati regni dei st austin's great work the city of god and tertullian's de cane Christi, in which the paradoxical sentence mortuus est dei filius credibile est quia ineptum est et sepultus resurrexit certum est quia impossibile est occupied my undivided time for many weeks of laborious and fruitless investigation thus it will appear that shaken from its balance only by trivial things my reason bore resemblance to that ocean crag spoken of by ptolemy hephaestion which steadily resisting the attacks of human violence and the fiercer fury of the waters and the winds trembled only to the touch of the flower called asphodel and although to a careless thinker it might appear a matter beyond doubt that the alteration produced by her unhappy malady in the moral condition of berenice would afford me many objects for the exercise of that intense and abnormal meditation whose nature i have been at some trouble in explaining yet such was not in any degree the case in the lucid intervals of my infirmity her calamity indeed gave me pain and taking deeply to heart that total wreck of her fair and gentle life i did not fail to ponder frequently and bitterly upon the wonder-working means by which so strange a revolution had been so suddenly brought to pass but these reflections partook not of the idiosyncrasy of my disease and were such as would have occurred under similar circumstances to the ordinary mass of mankind 
true to its own character. My disorder reveled in the less important but more startling changes wrought in the physical frame of Berenice, in the singular and most appalling distortion of her personal identity. During the brightest days of her unparalleled beauty, most surely I had never loved her. In the strange anomaly of my existence, feelings with me had never been of the heart, and my passions always were of the mind. Through the grey of the early morning, among the trellised shadows of the forest at noonday, and in the silence of my library at night, she had flitted by my eyes, and I had seen her, not as the living and breathing Berenice, but as the Berenice of a dream, not as a being of the earth earthy, but as the abstraction of such a being, not as a thing to admire, but to analyse, not as an object of love, but as the theme of the most abstruse, although desultory speculation, and now, now I shuddered in her presence, and grew pale at her approach, yet bitterly lamenting her fallen and desolate condition, I called to mind that she had loved me long, and in an evil moment I spoke to her of marriage. And at length the period of our nuptials was approaching, when, upon an afternoon in the winter of the year, one of those unseasonably warm, calm, and misty days, which are the nurse of the beautiful Halcyon. For as Jove, during the winter season, gives twice seven days of warmth, men have called this clement and temperate time the nurse of the beautiful Halcyon. Simone days. I sat and sat as I thought alone in the inner apartment of the library but uplifting my eyes, I saw that Berenice stood before me. Was it my own excited imagination, or the misty influence of the atmosphere, or the uncertain twilight of the chamber, or the grey draperies which fell around her figure, that caused in it so vacillating and indistinct an outline? I could not tell. She spoke no word, and I not for worlds could I have uttered a syllable. An icy chill ran through my frame. A sense of insufferable anxiety oppressed me. A consuming curiosity pervaded my soul, and sinking back upon the chair, I remained for some time breathless and motionless, with my eyes riveted upon her person. Alas, its emaciation was excessive and not one vestige of the former being lurked in any single line of the contour. My burning glances at length fell upon the face. The forehead was high and very pale and singularly placid, and the once jetty hair fell partially over it and overshadowed the hollow temples with innumerable ringlets now of a vivid yellow, and jarring discordantly in their fantastic character with the reigning melancholy of the countenance. The eyes were lifeless and lustreless and seemingly pupilless, and I shrank involuntarily from their glassy stare to the contemplation of the thin and shrunken lips. They parted, and in a smile of peculiar meaning, the teeth of the changed Berenice disclosed themselves slowly to my view. Would to God that I had never beheld them, or that, having done so, I had died! The shutting of a door disturbed me, and looking up, I found that my cousin had departed from the chamber but from the disordered chamber of my brain had not, alas, departed, and would not be driven away. The white and ghastly spectrum of the teeth 
not a speck on their surface not a shade on their enamel not an indenture in their edges but what that period of her smile had sufficed to brand in upon my memory i saw them now even more unequivocally than i beheld them then the teeth the teeth they were here and there and everywhere and visibly and palpably before me long narrow and excessively white with the pale lips writhing about them as in the very moment of their first terrible development then came the full fury of my monomania and i struggled in vain against its strange and irresistible influence in the multiplied objects of the external world i have no thoughts but for the teeth for these i longed with a frenzied desire all other matters and all different interests became absorbed in their single contemplation they they alone were present to the mental eye and they in their sole individuality became the essence of my mental life i held them in every light i turned them in every attitude i surveyed their characteristics i dwelt upon their peculiarities i pondered upon their conformation i mused upon the alteration in their nature i shuddered as i assigned to them in imagination a sensitive and sentient power and even when unassisted by the lips a capability of moral expression of mademoiselle salle it has been well said que tout c'est pas étienne des sentiments and of berenice i more seriously believe que tout c'est donc étienne des idées des idées ah here was the idiotic thought that destroyed me des idées ah therefore it was that i coveted them so madly i felt that their possession could alone ever restore me to peace in giving me back to reason and the evening closed in upon me thus and then the darkness came and tarried and went and the day again dawned and the mists of a second night were now gathering around and still i sat motionless in that solitary room and still i sat buried in meditation and still the phantasma of the teeth maintained its terrible ascendancy as with the most vivid hideous distinctness it floated about amid the changing lights and shadows of the chamber at length there broke in upon my dreams a cry as of horror and dismay and thereunto after a pause succeeded the sound of troubled voices intermingled with many low moanings of sorrow or of pain i arose from my seat and throwing open one of the doors of the library saw standing out in the antechamber a servant maiden all in tears who told me that berenice was no more she had been seized with epilepsy in the early morning and now at the closing in of the night the grave was ready for its tenant and all the preparations for the burial were completed i found myself sitting in the library and again sitting there alone it seemed that i had newly awakened from a confused and exciting dream i knew that it was now midnight and i was well aware that since the setting of the sun berenice had been interred but of that dreary period which intervened i had no positive at least no definite comprehension yet its memory was replete with horror horror more horrible from being vague and terror more terrible from ambiguity it was a fearful page in the record of my existence written all over with dim and hideous and unintelligible recollections i strive to decipher them but in vain while ever and anon like the spirit of a departed sound the shrill and piercing shriek of a female voice seemed to be ringing in my ears i had done a deed what was it i asked myself the question aloud and the whispering echoes of the chamber answered me what was it on the table beside me burned a lamp and near it lay a little box it was of no remarkable character 
and I had seen it frequently before, for it was the property of the family physician. But how came it there, upon my table, and why did I shudder in regarding it? These things were in no manner to be accounted for, and my eyes at length dropped to the open pages of a book, and to a sentence underscored therein. The words were the singular but simple ones of the poet Eben Zayat. Dicebant mici sodale si sepulcrum amice visitarem curas meas aliquantulam fore levatas. Why then, as I perused them, did the hairs of my head erect themselves on end, and the blood of my body become congealed within my veins? There came a light tap at the library door, and pale as the tenant of a tomb, a menial entered upon tiptoe. His looks were wild with terror, and he spoke to me in a voice tremulous, husky, and very low. What said he? Some broken sentences I heard. He told of a wild cry, disturbing the silence of the night, of the gathering together of the household, of a search in the direction of the sound, and then his tones grew thrillingly distinct as he whispered me of a violated grave, of a disfigured body enshrouded yet still breathing, still palpitating, still alive. He pointed to my garments. They were muddy and clotted with gore. I spoke not, and he took me gently by the hand. It was indented with the impress of human nails. He directed my attention to some object against the wall. I looked at it for some minutes. It was a spade. With a shriek, I bounded to the table and grasped the box that lay upon it but I could not force it open, and in my tremor it slipped from my hands, and fell heavily, and burst into pieces, and from it, with a rattling sound, there rolled out some instruments of dental surgery, intermingled with thirty-two small, white, and ivory-looking substances that were scattered to and fro about the floor. End of chapter 21